dear students, I welcome you to my class. And our today's discussion will concentrate on the Duchess of Malt by John Webster. I am Dr. Elham Hussein, welcome you to my class. The Duchess of Malfi is a Jacobian drama. It is not an Elizabethan drama. It's a Jacobian drama. And you know that Jacobian period started. Jacobian period started with the ascension of James the First to the throne of England in 1603 and you know that Queen Elizabeth died in 1603 and after her death James the first came to power and that was the beginning of Jacobian period actually Jacob is the Latin word for James for that reason we do not call it Jamesian period we call it Jacobian period. And Jacobian period lasted till 1625. 1625. And from 1625, Caroline period started. And this drama was staged between 1612 and 1640. So it is widely believed that this drama was a stage in 1630 or 12. Now, if we want to dig deeper into this text, I think it's our uh, important, our essential responsibility to approach this text from new historicist perspective. New historicist perspective refers to the contextual study of the text. That is, the text is produced in a particular period of the history. So our text has got a history as its context. So context is to be studied as a co-text. So co-text is to be studied very carefully if we want to digest different themes and subject matters of a particular text. For that reason, I just like to throw some light on different aspects of the particular period in which this drama was produced. You know that Jacobian period was a period for unrest. It was remarkable for political crisis. It was also remarkable for instability in social life, in religious life also. And you know that James I did not have the personality that Queen Elizabeth had. Actually, Queen Elizabeth's personality was very, very accommodative personality. And she could run her government with all the people, with all sections of people, with all types of ideas, with all different types of religious beliefs. That was undoubtedly a unique aspect of the personality of Queen Elizabeth. So her regime was comparatively stable. She enjoyed a comparatively stable and prosperous regime. And it was mostly because of her sagacious attitude and handling of the issues of, of her time. <clears throat> But James I did not have the personality, he could not share the personality of Queen Elizabeth. For example, he was very much intolerant towards the Catholics. 
and in all that, the Catholics constituted a huge section of Christian community. And that very huge section of Christian community was neglected by the king. And not only that, he also exercised hostility upon them. And for that reason, you know that on 5th November of 1605, under the leadership of Guy Fawkes, a Catholic priest, a Catholic priest, a conspiracy was made against the king. And that very conspiracy in history is popularly known as gunpowder plot. So it is one of the examples of uh, examples which was responsible for instability of the atmosphere during the reign of James I. And you know that James I was also uh, very much superstitious. He believed in ghosts, spirits, witches, witchcraft. And that very belief also made him cruel towards the aged ladies of the country. And if any natural calamity occurred in the country, James I suspected the old ladies of his country and they were punished. They were also killed very brutally. So that was his superstitious work. And he also wrote a book on uh, this occult belief. He wrote a book, Demonology. That is, he believed in demons, he believed in ghosts and spirits, and reflecting all his beliefs and attitudes towards these supernatural machines, he produced a book, Demonology. So he was such a very much superstitious king. Now, because of his intolerance towards different ideas or different attitudes, the stability of the country was violently disturbed or interrupted. And you know that. James I believed in omnipotence of the king. He believed that a king was a lieutenant of God. And a king had the supernatural power of recovering or curing any kind of disease if he could touch a diseased person that very diseased person would recover so That was his another superstitious belief. So all these things constituted his personality. And all these ingredients of his personality affected the political and social atmosphere of his time. And you know, at that time, uh, another important thing happened. And that was the Renaissance. You know, that Elizabethan age experienced Renaissance. And the intensification of Renaissance occurred in Jacobian period. Because during Jacobian period, England was integrated with Scotland. And UK, today we call it UK, that is the United Kingdom. The conception of United Kingdom was formulated during the reign of James I. Queen Elizabeth was not the Queen of United Kingdom. She was the Queen of England. But James I was the first King of UK, that is United Kingdom. So that was a very uh, important historical incident. Another important incident that I like to mention here during the reign of James I, the British colony became permanent 
and consolidated in America. That is, America was colonized by Britain uh, very much strongly during the reign of James I. So because of Renaissance, navigation developed, communication developed. So British colonization spread and British colonization reached America and it took America in its grip. And that very process was accelerated or geared up, intensified during the reign of James I. So these are the historical incidents that constituted the time of the reign of James I. Another dark aspect of the age that I like to mention for your sake, it was an age of political corruption. Actually, political sanctity, or if you want to term this word as stability, that is political stability, mostly depends on the personality of the ruler. If the ruler is morally derailed, or if the ruler is morally corrupted, then the followers, or even the public, must be corrupted. Actually, this is human psychology to uh, follow the superiors. Suppose the students follow the teachers, and teachers follow their teachers. So why? Because we always look for an idol. And if the idol is corrupted, then what would be the condition of the imitators or followers? The followers must be misguided. That would corrupt them. And that also happened. Actually, that was the reality of that time, as the king's personality was loose, as the king's personality was not strong enough to unite all sorts of nuances or differences together. Because of that very shortcoming or limitation of the personality of that ruler, that is James I, political corruption was rampant during that time. And if you think of the status of drama or theater or theatrical activities or the theatrical forms, then you will also find decadence, that is declination of artistic values or aesthetic values. As the social values deteriorated, as the political values deteriorated, it is very, very natural. It is very much uh, common that with the deterioration of moral values or social values, literary values also deteriorated. That was a very common feature of that age. The lofty status of Elizabethan dramas could not be maintained during Jacobian period. But Jacobian dramas could not sustain the lofty or glorious status of Elizabethan dramas or Shakespearean dramas. And Jacobian dramas suffered very terribly regarding its form and also regarding its subject matter regarding its structure, regarding the portrayal of characters. So you will find a very conspicuous declination or uh, deterioration in all these aspects of dramas. So keeping all these things in your mind, if you now approach this text, the Duchess of Malta, I think it will be easier for you to understand the text or to approach the text very critically. Actually, one thing that you must not forget that your duty is not to read the summary of the text. Your duty is to read the text critically. Every student is a critic. 
you must not forget that you are a critic. So if you want to be a good critic, you have to be a good reader. So anyway, uh, it's my suggestion to you to approach this text critically and then that will help you understand this text easily and meaningfully. Now, I just like to give you some ideas about the genre of this text. And while discussing these things, I will give you some more ideas about different aspects of the age that directly and indirectly influenced the formation of this text. Genre. If you think of the genre of this text, you will find that it is a Jacobian revenge tragedy. Tragedy, you know, you, you are well acquainted with the definition of tragedy that you have already known from Aristotle's poetics. Now, what is revenge tragedy? Actually, a tragedy is called a revenge tragedy while its dominating motive is revenge. So if the motive of a tragedy is basically revenge, then we call it a revenge tragedy. I think it is the simplest definition of a revenge tragedy. So what is a revenge tragedy? A revenge tragedy is a tragedy in which we find revenge motive. So you will find here revenge um, avengers. You will find here uh, the horrible implementation of uh, vengeance. You will also find here the horrible implementation of jealousy. Sometimes it is sexual jealousy and sometimes it is jealousy of status. Sometimes revenge is mostly guided by ego or egoistic disposition. Sometimes this revenge is uh, motivated by overconsciousness of the royal status or royal blood. So all these things have constituted revenge motive in this tragedy. Now I have <coughs> given here some ideas about revenge tragedy and you will also be acquainted with some names of revenge tragedies. Revenge tragedy is a theoretical genre in which the principal theme is revenge. The genre first appeared in the early modern detail with the publication of Thomas Keats, The Spanish Tragedy, during the later half of the 16th century. You must have heard the name of Thomas Keats. is one of the university wits, and he is called English Seneca. You must have heard the name of Seneca, a Roman dramatist, rhetorician, and it is said that Seneca was the home tutor of the most notorious emperor of the world, Nero. Nero was the emperor of Rome and he was the most notorious emperor, very, very oppressive and tyrannical ruler and Seneca was his tutor. And unfortunately, he was also killed by Nero. This Seneca influenced the Elizabethan dramatists more than the Greek dramatists like Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides, or Thespis. These Greek dramatists did not influence the Elizabethans more than the Roman dramatist Seneca. Seneca wrote dramas not for the stage. Seneca wrote dramas for reading. And for that reason, Senecan dramas are remarkable for long rhetorical speeches. And as Senecan dramas were 
written for a reading chamber or reading room, they are called closing dramas because those dramas were read in closed room. So anyway, I will give you some more ideas about Seneca very soon. And before that, I just like to make you acquainted with some more ideas about revenge tragedies and the writers of revenge tragedies in English literature. Earlier works such as Jesper Heyud's translations. Jesper Heyud was one of the major translators of Elizabethan period. And he translated lots of writings of his time. So his translation of Seneca and Thomas Norton and Thomas Sackville's play, the uh, Garbodak. You know, that like Garbodak is popularly known as the first tragedy of English literature. Garbodak was the king of England. Actually, the, this is the story. I just uh, like to tell you in brief. Garbodak was the king, and he had two sons, Forex and Perex, and the queen was also there. And while Garbodak became <coughs> very old, then the eldest son became the king of the country. But the younger son was jealous of the elder brother, so he killed his brother and became the king. And the queen became very much frustrated and she was also uh, furious. She killed the other son who became the king after killing his brother. So while the killing was going on there, the public, that is the people of the country became very much angry and they came and attacked the palace and they killed the king and the queen. So thus we find revenge motive here. The revenge motive, that is one brother is taking revenge upon another brother and he is motivated by power. So the power, greed for power, or covetousness for power is sowing the seed of revenge motive in these characters. And you know that killing is very much rampant in this drama. In Garbuta, killing, bloodshed, or uh, horror elements such as souls, daggers, cords for hanging. So, all these elements are very rampant. And these are the elements which have been borrowed from Seneca dramas. These are the elements of Seneca dramas. Understand? So, Garbodak is not a tragedy in the sense of Shakespearean tragedies. You cannot make it a parallel of Shakespearean tragedies, but it has got some elements of tragedy. It arises pity. It also arises fear. For that reason, we can call it a tragedy, though it does not have the status of Elizabethan tragedies or a classical tragedy. So we call it our revenge tragedy. Anyway, uh, then the other revenge tragedy, very popular revenge tragedy, you will find with Shakespeare. Shakespeare's Hamlet is also a revenge tragedy. And Hamlet, throughout the drama, is motivated by his revenge motive. That is, his father was killed by his villainous uncle and he decided to take revenge upon his uncle, that is his father's killer. And he waited for further proofs or evidences. And ultimately, at the end of this drama, you will find that Hamlet implemented his revenge motive, that is he killed his uh, uncle. And unfortunately, he was also killed. So this drama has uh, got lots of features of a revenge strategy. And you will find uh, more revenge tragedies in English literature and with Shakespeare. 
suppose Titus and Rubinus. This is another women's tragedy. Then Thomas Middleton, the revenge, <coughs> the revengers tragedy. So these are very remarkable revenge tragedies that we find in Elizabethan period, and we find also in Jacobian period. Okay. Now, I have already told you that Elizabethan dramatists were more influenced by Seneca than by the Greek dramatists like Aeschyla, Sophocles, or Euripides. Now, what particular aspects of Senecan dramas were borrowed by the Elizabethan dramas or Elizabethan dramatists? First of all, the theme of revenge. The theme of revenge, you know, in uh, Senecan revenge tragedy, we find that a man is unjustly killed. Actually, I am telling you in brief or superficial regarding the subject matter of Senecan tragedy or revenge tragedy. In Senecan revenge tragedy, we usually find a man killed unjustly. Then his ghost comes back from the underworld and he appoints an avenger. Avenger means avenger refers to the man who takes revenge on behalf of the man who is unjustly killed. So the ghost comes back from the underworld, appoints a man, that very man may be the dead's uh, friend. Or, or are related. And that very avenger takes revenge upon the man who committed that very diabolical crime. That is the crime of killing the man unjustly. So in Senegal, revenge tragedy, we find ghost, we find killing we find bloodshed, we find some horror elements, for example, swords, daggers, or for strangulation, cords or ropes. So all these elements are very frequently used in Seneca revenge tragedy. And these elements are borrowed by Elizabethan dramatists or Jacobian dramatists. You will find these elements in Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy. Thomas Kidd is called English Seneca because of his too much adherence to Senecan style, Senecan uh, way of presenting revenge motif or theme of revenge and melodramatic atmosphere for all these regions and for his rhetorical technique or diction, we call Tawaski English Seneca. Then another important element of Seneca and driven strategy is bloodshed. Then supernatural elements are ghosts. Then you will find darkness. Darkness is a very important element in driven strategy because darkness is associated with atmosphere, with the atmosphere of horror. It creates horror, it intensifies the atmosphere of horror. And you know that almost all the crimes take place in darkness. So darkness is associated with crimes, killing, bloodshed, or vile or diabolical activities. Then long declamatory speech or rhetorical speech. This is another important feature of Seneca drama, and it is also a difficulty. It is also a fatal limitation of Seneca revenge tragedies, because such a long declamatory speech is not to be, it is not easy for the actor or actress to memorize and deliver on the stage smoothly or spontaneously. It's very, very difficult. But for reading, it's okay. But while you will try to memorize it and deliver 
this long speech on the stage is difficult. And such long declamatory speeches may bore the audience. So you will have the risk of boring the audience. For that, Senegan dramas are not fit for uh, stage. They are fit for reading chamber. The murder or killing, another important feature of Seneca tragedies. And then rigorous implementation of poetic justice. That is, poetic, poetic justice is observed in a Seneca written tragedy. So, what is poetic justice? Poetic justice very grossly refers to the distribution of justice. That is, if you are bad or if you are an evil doer then you will be punished and if you are a good person then you will be rewarded that is a very gross definition of poetic justice actually poetic justice is the apportionment of rewards and punishment exactly according to the merits and defects of the that is called poetic justice. That is distribution of justice. If you are uh, an evil doer, you will be punished. And if you are a good person, you will be rewarded. In Seneca Revenge tragedy, we find very rigorous implementation of poetic justice. This is a very important characteristic of Seneca. Now, we will find how these elements overlap or how these elements coincide John Webster's The Duchess of Monday. If we read this text very closely and critically, you will find that this drama is saturated with Senecan elements. And you will find that it's a revenge tragedy. But many critics have complained that the revenge motif of this drama is not satisfactorily mentioned. Now, why? Why do they say so? I will answer to this question. And while I will answer to this question, I will tell you the story of this drama in brief. <clears throat> from the new historicist perspective, it's a decadence play reflecting the turmoil of the Jacobian period. You know it, I have already told you. And during the Elizabethan age, tragedy, comedy, and tragic comedy are produced spontaneously, you know, very well. But in Jacobian period, you will find a sort of uh, deterioration or declination of the enthusiasm of Elizabethan dramas. And the loss of revenge motive or the vagueness of revenge motive of this drama is one of the examples of this very decade. So the revenge motif of this drama is not clear. Now, how do we know it? And the complaint that many critics have lost is not baseless. If we come to the story of this drama in brief, then we find that the Duchess, whose real name is Giovanna, and this Giovanna's name is not mentioned in this drama. Remember this. She's a historical character. And you know that during Elizabethan period, it is because of the influence of Renaissance, Elizabethan dramatists and Jacobian dramatists showed much interest <clears throat> in the elements for their dramas.
from Italy, that is from the neighboring country, Italy. So Malfi is a province in Italy, and Duchess was the Duchess of Malfi, and it is said that while she was only 13 years of age, she was married, and while she was only 19, while she was only 19, her husband was killed in a battle. So the Duchess was a young widow. She received her widowhood at the age of 19. And by that time, she had a son by her first husband. <clears throat> at one point of this drama, you will find that Duchess's two brothers refer to that very son. While they came to know that their sister had secretly married uh, Antonio, then they became furious and they decided to convey that very news to the son of the Duchess so that that very son might feel ashamed of the shameful that is in the words of the brothers or nasty deed of second marriage of the duchess so anyway the duchess was a young widow and these two brothers that is Ferdinand, who was the twin brother of the duchess and the cardinal cardinal is not the name it's an epithet imposed by the church upon a church man. So, Ferdinand and Cardinal, these two brothers, strictly prohibited their sister not to marry for the second time. Now, why did they prohibit their sister to choose the second husband? That was quite unclear. Some critics say that most probably Ferdinand had a secret, a secret intention of establishing illicit relationship with the Duchess. And some other critics say that these two brothers had an intention to inherit the property of the Duchess. For that reason, they did not want that their sister should marry for the second time. And the Duchess also promised that she would not marry. And if she married, then she would take prior consent from her two brothers. But as soon as the brothers left her palace, the Duchess quoted Antonio, that is her steward. Her steward was owed by the Duchess, who was much inferior to the Duchess in his status. He was only a servant. Now you may find it quite unusual. The Duchess was the mistress of the house and Antonio was a servant. So how is it possible that a mistress of the house quoted or offered love to her servant? How is it possible? You may think that it is quite unbelievable. But if you read the history of 17th century, then you will find that the servants or the maid servants in the house, household who worked for many days or who uh, served very faithfully in a family, they enjoyed the status of the members of the family. They could enjoy the status of the members of the family and they were considered important in the family. So from history, you can uh, collect this information. It may seem to be unbelievable that a mistress of the house 
offered love to our servant, how is it possible? It is historically possible because in history, especially in 17th century history, if you read the history of aristocratic society, aristocratic family, you will find that it was a very common practice of keeping servants or keeping uh, maid servants in the house. And they worked for many days or many years in the household of that uh, particular rich man. And in course of time, they developed intimacy or closeness with the inmates of the house. And they enjoyed the status of the members of the house, members of the family. So most probably that was a reason for which the Duchess felt her uh, interest, or the Duchess found her interest in Antonio. Okay. Anyway, Antonio was embarrassed as soon as he found that the Duchess offered her love to him. But it is because of the Duchess's over-enthusiasm. And it was because of the Duchess's over-infatuation. Antonio <coughs> complied with her proposal. And in presence with Cariola, the waiting maid, Antonio married the Duchess. That is, the Duchess married Antonio. Okay, they exchanged rings and they married. And Cariola was the witness of that marriage. Now critically, if you critically uh, observe this very incident or this very action of the Duchess, you will find that Duchess has done or committed a great, a great mistake here. So what was the mistake? You know that Mary's required religious recognition and social recognition. Suppose in our society, and if you find the marriage ceremony among the Muslims, what do you find? There is a hujur is called, or kaji is called, and kaji utters some holy words from our holy Quran, and then he solemnizes marriage between a man and a woman. That is called religious recognition. The religion recognizes or acknowledges your marriage. Then while you will invite your neighbors, your relatives to your marriage, then they will give you recognition. That is called social recognition. And while you sign on your register book, your country gives recognition. That is, you, you get legal recognition, political recognition. So marriage requires recognitions, remember. But the Duchess did not care. The religious institution, she did not care. Social institution, she did not care. Political recognition or acknowledgement. That was her fatal drawback. Okay. And many critics say that that is Duchess's tragic flaw. If you call Duchess a tragic heroine, then you must search for her tragic flaw. So what is her tragic flaw? Her tragic flaw is her uh, foolishness in hiding her marriage or her uh, indifference to the religious recognition, social recognition and political recognition for her marriage. That was her fatal drawback. And that very drawback infuriated two brothers while they came to know from Bosola. Bosola, you know, I spy, he is called a malcontent meditator. He is quite dissatisfied with his achievement in life. And he is set as a spy <coughs> by 
the two brothers. And Duchess could not recognize him. Duchess gave him the job of the supervisor of her uh, uh, stable. And Basola kept a very watchful eye upon the activities of the Duchess. So this very Basola, with his cunningness, discovered that the Duchess married Antonio. And while that very truth was disclosed to the two brothers, they decided to take revenge. And with much difficulties, Antonio played away with his son, with one son, and two more children were left with the Duchess. And Duchess was arrested. She was taken in custody, and there she was mentally tortured by mad maid. They humiliated Duchess using some poisonous words or toxic words. But Duchess proved herself to be a Duchess, even in her imprisonment, even in her confinement. Even immediately before her strangulation, she declared that she was esteemed the Duchess of so that very boldness or bravery proves that she is a very fit, tragic heroine of this drama. So in the fourth act of this drama, we find that the Duchess was strangled and the waiting woman, that is Cariola, was also strangled and her son, that is the Duchess's two children, were also strangled. And the drama might have ended with the tragedy or with the strangulation of the Duchess. But John Webster was so much didactic that he could not uh, but extend the plot of the drama up to the fifth act. In the fifth act, we find that these evil doers, that is, Ferdinand, the Cardinal, Vasola, were also killed. You know that Ferdinand went mad and the Cardinal also went mad. They behaved abnormally. And Vasola very dramatically underwent a very dramatic change of his mind as he was deprived by Ferdinand. He killed or he arranged the killing of the Duchess uh, because he was tempted for reward. As he was not rewarded after the strangulation of the Duchess, he decided to take revenge upon two brothers. And he also discovered that the Duchess was innocent and he committed a misdeed by killing such an innocent uh, woman. So because of his self-realization, he decided to take revenge upon two brothers and save Antonio. But very unfortunately, by mistake in the darkness, he stabbed Antonio to death. And then he stabbed uh, Ferdinand to death, and Cardinal was also killed. And thus, at the end of this drama, we find some dead bodies on the stage. The stage is littered with some dead bodies. It is another important aspect of Senecan drama. In Senecan dramas, we find, especially at the end of Senecan dramas, we find some dead bodies left on the stage. And we find the reflection of that very Senecan aspect in this drama. So this is, in brief, the long and short of this drama. Now, while reading this drama, you will find that the world, the political world that is depicted here is utterly corrupted. Here, brothers are conspiring against sister. Here, a man who appears to be a holy man, a church man, 
makes secret relationship with another woman. Suppose the cardinal keeps a mistress. Julia is his mistress. So he will find a corrupted atmosphere. And Bosola has very aptly defined politicians in this drama. Bosola at a very close quarter has observed the behavior and activities of these two brothers. And he has called them two crooked plum trees of which are leaning over a, a pond and their fruits are not eatable or edible for any human beings, their fruits are eaten only by some uh, vile insects or caterpillars. So they are the politicians whose activities are never benevolent for the people. Whatever they produce, whatever they do, are male malevolent for the people. And from that very discovery, Bosola has defined uh, also a politician. Who is a politician? In his eyes, a politician is a devil's quilted anvil. Actually, I am quoting from uh, Bosola's observation. Bosola has defined a politician in, in, in these words. Actually, I am uttering his words. There is a politician is a devil's quilted anvil. He fashions all things but the blows are never hard. That is a politician secretly exercises all sorts of evil deeds. But the common people usually uh, do not know their evil practices. They always remain in darkness regarding the evil practice or malevolent practices of the politicians. Actually, if you uh, critically observe Bosola's definition of a politician, then you must go for the context. If you think of the time in which this drama was produced, you can easily understand that that was the time of the politicians like these two brothers. And that was the time of the corrupted people like Bosola. And that was the time for jealousy. That was the time of envy. That was the time of revenge motive. That was the time of all sorts of delay. So John Webster, as a very socially, politically, and morally conscious dramatist, has dramatized all his critical observations of the time in this text. So this text is a historical document in the form of a drama. You know that a drama is a form of art. And an art is not an explicit discourse of history. And that is called, uh, uh, we, we call it uh, the history, historicity of the text, or textuality of history. So we find a sort of uh, intersection of history and text. And while this intersection is made very artistically, aesthetically, then it becomes a piece of literature. It becomes a piece of art. And John Webster is undoubtedly a great artist. While we discover how subtly and dexterously he has uh, brought about this intersection between history and historicity and textuality, then we find that he is undoubtedly a great artist. He has brought about this mythopoesis very artistically. But some critics have complained that 
this drama is structurally a failure. So why? Because as we find the structure of Elizabethan dramas, especially tragedy, if you think of tragedy, then you find that in tragedy we find exposition, we find climax, we also find catastrophe. In this drama, we find exposition. In the first act, he will be acquainted with almost all the characters of this drama. Then the story proceeds and it uh, reaches the climax while two brothers came to know the secret marriage of their sister. And ultimately, the Duchess was imprisoned and she was strangled. That is called catastrophe. So the drama should have been ended with the fourth act. But the fifth act is an extension. In fifth act, we find the tragedy of the doers of tragedy. A tragedy usually ends with the tragedy of the tragic hero or the tragic hero. But we find that this drama ends with the tragedy of the doers of tragedy. We find the fall of Persona, we find the fall of Ferdinand and the Cardinal. So many critics think that structurally this drama is a failure. But if you think of the language, if you think of rhetorical elements of this drama, if you think of blank verse, if you think of images or imagery of this drama, then you will obviously call it a drama which is very close to Shakespearean dramas. It has got affinity with Shakespearean dramas regarding its uh, brilliance of diction, regarding its brilliance of imagery, regarding its wealth of language, regarding its wealth of rhetorics or rhetorical devices. So it is very close to Shakespearean tragedies. But structurally, it has got a very fatal drawback. We find climax, and the last or the fifth act is branded by many critics as anti-climax. So in this way, we find that this Duchess of Malfi is a great tragedy. It is great regarding its artistic uh, accumulation of different elements that have given it a lofty status of art. And at the same time, because of its structural flow, it has uh, suffered. So anyway, I think you have got some ideas about the story, about the revenge motif, and about uh, different aspects of this drama. And you have also got some ideas about the themes of this drama that I have already told you. You will find here political corruption. You find here cruelty of brothers, cruelty of Posola. You find here the act of heroism, for example, heroism of the Duchess. You will find here meta theater, elements of meta theater. Meta theater refers to a term which uh, says that a drama attracts the audience because of its some artistic or particular aspects. For example, the presentation of spectacle, for example, the presentation of some artistic supports. With these devices, the drama captures the attention of the audience. Actually, this is a technique of meta theater, and you will find this technique very powerfully applied in this text. So, in my next class, I will give you some more ideas about different aspects of this text, and I will also explain this text. Uh, critically. So no more today. Thank you very much. And I thank you especially for 
attending this session. Now I'd like to invite your questions. Do you have any question on what you have already heard from me? Okay, I think you don't have any question. Do you have any question? Okay, I got a question from Orna, Kanbin Orna. That is, why did Basola kill the Karina? Actually, these two brothers appointed Basola as a spy, you know. He was appointed spy, a spy by these two brothers. And it is also said by Bosola towards the beginning of this drama, you will find that Bosola says that <clears throat> once being instigated by these two brothers, he committed a murder. That is, he murdered a man. And for that crime, he had to spend seven years in the gallows. And these two brothers did not help him, did not reward him. So that very incident gave him an intensive negative perception about these two brothers, the lady. And his uh, this negative perception about his about these two brothers was intensified more while he was deceived for the second time. That is, he was appointed or he was uh, assigned to make arrangement for killing the Duchess. So he made all these things possible. That is, he arranged the people, the cruel people, that is the hangmen to strangle the duchess, to strangle the children of the duchess. That is, duchess was strangled under his supervision. And he did all these things for reward. But while the duchess was killed, Ferdinand came to see the dead body of the duchess. And Ferdinand felt repentant. He said, cover her face, mine eyes dazzle, she died young. Okay. And after that, he drove away Basola. He threatened him that if he did not flee now, he would kill her. So Basola was deprived of his reward. And while he was deceived repeatedly by these two brothers, and while he achieved self-realization, after killing the Duchess, such an innocent lady, the Duchess was innocent. The boldness and towering personality of the Duchess impressed Bosola. So while he developed these realizations, he decided that he would punish himself or, or he would do something for his expiation. Expiation, you know that, prashchitta. That is, he would do something for his expiations. Now, what would he do? He would kill the killer of the Duchess. He would kill the killers of the Duchess. And he did, or he killed these two brothers with a view to expiating himself from the sin that he had gathered after killing such an innocent lady. Okay, so that was the emotion, or that was the impulse that motivated Bosola to kill these two brothers. All right, I think you have got your answer. Do you have any more question? Okay, Meta Theater. Adiba Mehjabin, you have wanted to know 
meta theater, the town meta theater. Meta theater, meta means, you know, beyond. Meta means beyond. So beyond theater. Uh, in the theater, we, the audience enjoy a drama, a dramatic performance. Suppose the characters would appear on the stage, they will exchange dialogues, and there will be conflict, there will be uh, killing, or there will be love making. All these incidents are usually included in a drama. But to create some, uh, create atmosphere, or to, or to create some effect. The dramatists apply some devices. For example, he may uh, arrange uh, music or orchestra. He may also uh, arrange paintings or the paintings may be set just behind the stage to create an effect that we also call a spectacle. And some other devices are employed in a drama to create effect, horror effect, or to create a romantic atmosphere, or to create the atmosphere that the writer or that the dramatist wants to create. So these extra techniques or extra ingredients which are used to draw the attention of the audience and to create a particular atmosphere. These are called the elements of meta theater. Okay. Suppose in this drama, you will find the dummy of the dead body of Antony. It was made of wax, and the Duchess was uh, shown this figure. And Duchess was given a wrong idea that. Uh, Antonio was killed. Actually, Antonio was not killed. He was not found out or caught up. But the Duchess was given an impression that Antonio was killed. And then the Duchess lost her interest in life. She wanted to die uh, soon or sooner. So an effect of killing or an effect of nothingness was created with this dead body. Dummy of the dead body of that is an element of meditation. Okay. So thank you. I think you have got the answers to your questions. If you have some more questions, you may uh, ask me. Do you have any more question? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.